Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. We're happy to have you here at New Life Church. My name is Paula Severson, and I actually represent New Life Church on the Cottage Grove Cares Coalition. And the Cottage Grove Cares Coalition was formed several years ago, along with the Monona Cares Coalition, to work on um, anti-drug activity um, and also underage alcohol use in our community um, to make an impact, especially with our youth. So um, I'm, I'm happy that you're all here. A um, couple of quick things just before we get started. Um, if you need a restroom, there are restrooms out where you came. Otherwise, there's restrooms straight out this um, area and down the hallway. Um, if you brought a child with you, that's great. Um, if at any time you feel that the content might be a little bit too heavy um, for them, we do have child care available. Again, it's all the way out these doors to the hallway in the left, and we have some volunteers um, from our congregation who have gone through background training and, and such. Um, so um, just feel free to exit. Um, there are notepads at the end of each aisles. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to hear from each of our panelists and then save time for questions and answers at the end because what we might find is that the next panelist will answer the questions. So we want to leave time for questions. Um, why are we here? Um, as we all know, we watch the news. Um, we have an, a heroin epidemic um, in the state of Wisconsin. And we probably always think, well, it's, it's somewhere else, right? Um, but I don't know how many of you have seen the pictures that were posted of hypodermic needles in Thaden Park in the pond. I mean, it's here. It's here, folks. So given that, and also on your way out, there's a brochure both about Monona Cares and Cottage Grove Cares. And it gives some statistics, which are pretty um, startling, actually, from the Dane County Youth Survey. The Monona Grove School District participates in this youth survey. And back in 2015, these were some of the responses from our students in our district. 114 Monona Grove High School students reported getting drunk in the past 30 days. 96 Monona Grove High School students reported binge drinking in the past 30 days. 47 students reported the main reason they haven't had a drink of alcohol is because their parents would be disappointed in them. So parents, I cannot encourage you enough to keep talking to your kids. 40 Monona Grove High School students reported using synthetic marijuana. 70 Monona Grove High School students reported using non-prescription medication and prescription medication to get high. And the most troubling one to me is that 16 Monona Grove High School students reported using heroin. 13 of those reported using more than once a month or more. So we have this in our midst, and we're doing a lot of great things. So throughout this evening, you're going to hear from a panel of experts. Um, they're going to cover kind of the statewide, but they're also going to cover the local, what's going on locally. And again, there will be time for questions um, as well. Yeah. And we're going to start with Chief Labor, um, who is our Cottage Grove Village Police Chief. Um, just a little bit about Chief Labor and his background. Um, prior to coming to Cottage Grove, he was the Milton, um, City of Milton Police Chief. And before that, he was also with the Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation as well. Um, he served in the U.S. Army and Wisconsin Army National Guard for seven years as a military policeman and military police investigator. He has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and attended the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. So very neat background as well. So Chief, can you tell us a little bit about what, what's been going on right in Cottage Grove? Sure. The incidents we've been seeing, I've, I started in Cottage Grove in April of 2015 and it, the incidents have been steady since then. In August, we arrested a subject who was 35 years old. He had been coming into the Piggly Wiggly right down the road here and stealing high-end liquor uh, and would just walk out of the store with it. If he was confronted, he'd just put it down on the ground and go away. He did this about two, three times. We finally got there before he got away, and we had a three-hour literal manhunt in the swamps over there and we finally caught him and we learned from him that he had been doing this for the past two years and he's, an hero he's a heroin addict and to feed his problem 
He's stealing liquor from liquor stores all across South Central and Southwest Wisconsin. He's been arrested at least 14 times. He keeps on getting caught for this. As soon as he gets out of jail or bails himself out, back to doing the same thing. He takes the alcohol to the dealer, gets roughly 25 cents on the dollar for it, and it feeds his habit. He is the son of a law enforcement officer, local law enforcement officer, came from a very good family, but this is his deal. This is what he does. He will not become combative with anybody. He will run away, but here's someone that's 35 years old and this drug just runs his life. Uh, he's still out there. Last week he was in Milton doing it. He and his girlfriend are stealing still at this point. Uh, he's been prosecuted, he's been sentenced to jail, but he can't stop. September 23rd, three ounces of heroin was seized from a residence right here in Cottage Grove on Parkview Street. Now three ounces of heroin is a lot of heroin. That is not user quantity. That is what you would find in a major city, i.e. Madison, and it's a large-scale heroin trafficker operating right here in Cottage Grove. They also had a couple drug houses in Madison they were operating out of, and then that was the Dane County drug unit that conducted that investigation with our assistance. October 29th, we had two overdoses of 22-year-old women here in Cottage Grove on Main Street. One of them got the drugs earlier in the day from a drug dealer in Madison, and she's 22 years old, injects herself, and boom, dead on the floor. Roommate calls the police, immediately starts, and EMS immediately starts CPR. We get there, uh, Deer Grove EMS gets there, they administer Narcan, she's brought back and goes off to the hospital. That same house, <laughs> 6 a.m. the next day, same thing happens to the girl that was standing there watching her friend overdose. She takes those drugs and overdoses uh, less than 12 hours later. Same thing. Uh, the same guy that did CPR on the other one, he's back doing it again on her. Narcan's administered by the Deer Grove EMS that patient is brought back. So two overdoses in the same house within 24 hours. And then on February 10th in the town of Pleasant Springs, just south of Cottage Grove, we had uh, two people in a van. They both used heroin. Both went down in the van. Thank God somebody drove by and saw them and reported this. Again, Deer Grove EMS responds administers Narcan, which, is the, which brings people back miraculously most of the time from heroin overdoses. And one of the individuals, a 32-year-old man from Wapan, he died. The homeless man with him survived. And these are 21 and 36-year-old men. The suppliers, and here's where things get very, very serious, is not only are they endangering people's lives, but these suppliers are eligible for up to 40 to 60 years in prison if they supply the heroin or the drugs that kills someone. So those two subjects from Stoughton and Monona were both arrested for the delivery of the heroin. And then in February of this year, we are seeing a huge uptick in the amount of heroin overdoses and uh, Dwayne Urshan, the chief from Deer Grove EMS, can speak to that if you'd like to. Go right ahead. <laughs> so, <clears throat> my name is Dwayne Urshan. I'm the, the chief of Deer Grove EMS, uh, the local EMS um, here. And um, <clears throat> the, um, um, uh, to, to start off with, um, in talking about heroin use, um, the, the, it's interesting and necessary to kind of understand how is it possible for people to get addicted to this so easily. Um, part of the reason is a physiological um, aspect of it is that our bodies actually produce opiates, uh, endorphins. So when we do exercise and things like that and you have this kind of a, you feel strong and, and potent, um, that is actually your body having re released natural endorphins, which are a type of... Uh, opiate. 
So our body already has um, some uh, uh, a mechanism in it that kn knows and understands these chemicals. And so when it's put into the body um, for the purpose of uh, creating a euphoria or whatever, the body um, uh, utilizes these things easily. Um, so, and, and that's generally uh, what people use these drugs for is euphoria or to, um, to stop pain. Um, and very often, the similar to the story that the uh, detective shared, uh, we hear as well people who were in car accidents, who people who were just injured in normal everyday injuries, um, who end up having a, an addiction problem after that. Um, so, the uh, the drug that we have available to us that helps to uh, counter the effects of the opiate overdose is Narcan. And um, the Narcan is actually a very effective antidote to opiate use. Um, and, and when we administer the Narcan, it, uh, very, it, uh, very often it'll quickly have an effect. So what happens is that there, the nervous system that has these, the opiates on them the Narcan will come and replace those and release them from the, uh, the, the, the cells. And then with, with the Narcan there and the opiate off, they'll come back essentially to a, a pretty normal state. So one of the things with that for us is that when we treat people um, with the Narcan and we know that they, or, or that we suspect that they may have the opiate overdose, um, we try to do that actually in a, a bit smaller doses because when they, um, when they come back from it, very often they may be um, agitated, sometimes upset because you've taken, taken away the, the high, um, sometimes upset because they, they don't understand the situation that they've put themselves in. They find the room filled with law enforcement and EMS and they, don't, they don't, just don't know how that all happened. Um, so, the uh, in our local region here, and looking back, I, I look back to like 2007, um, and and then coming forward, and we find really in this area we've been dealing with this issue um, at least at the very beginning about seven times a year, eleven times a year, thirteen times a year uh, last year, and um, uh, and as uh, Chief Labor pointed out, um, this year we've we've found that the increase is a big spike. Um, so Dane, in Dane County, um, for let's see, um, for January to February last year, they had 66 uses of the Narcan. Now, when they use Narcan, it's not always for overdoses. Sometimes, if there's somebody who's unconscious and 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 uh, they don't know if they might be using uh, uh, opiates, then we have to use it to rule out something else. But very often, it, it'll be that. And so this year, from January to February 25th, there was 146 uses of Narcan. From 66 last year to that point to 146. So it's a huge uh, increase. It's a, it's a big problem out there. And um, and as well as as you know, very often, like I, uh, describing the effects of this antidote, it it, uh, it it very quickly will bring some type of uh, consciousness back, you know. And so we'll know, okay, now they're alive, and we can do what we need to do. So very often we have to start CPR and and work a, a regular code and everything like that, and then we get the Narcan in the system, and then a lot of times they'll come back. But in this particular case, that didn't happen. So it doesn't always happen that we can save them. And, um, you know, the circumstances that uh, played into that, it may have been some other underlying thing, or maybe the person was in the vehicle for a long time, or, you know, you just don't know. So, certainly, it's an epidemic. And, and these are things that we have been seeing, and it, it, it's in our small town area here. So, it's not uh, uh, something that is foreign to this, to this area, for sure. Now, what we can do, 
you know, I, I think one of this, this is a huge step to begin to have an education process, to have people understand that this is an epidemic, um, and to also to have an understanding of, of um, the fact that this can be a relative. It can be uh, old or young. Uh, so it's not something that is, is going to be, um, you know, always some other place and some other, uh, other, other uh, situation. It can come close to your family. It can enter your family. And again, it doesn't have to be a situation of, uh, uh, you know, some shady upbringing or anything like that. It can be regular, everyday people who just found themselves into this situation. It's easy to do because the body is already inclined to it. And, and you know, people suffer from different pains. Sometimes it's physical pain, other times it's not. And uh, so the attraction to this is, is huge. And the, the only thing that's really going to help out, I think, is, is really creating an increase of education. Um, there's there's uh, state laws that have been passed now to make Narcan more available. Um, but again, uh, as that becomes the case, it may become more prevalent as well. With, if the psychology starts to, to set in that, well, somebody will be there to give me this. I've, I've heard it rumored as well. We can ask the agents, but I've heard it rumored as well that some of the dealers actually give Narcan with the medication. And sometimes they'll have like a designated Narcan holder. Uh, by, I've heard the story of, you know, a person who will see that individual um, enjoying their high. He's supposed to be there with the Narcan, but he says, oh, they're having a good time. So they join them and both of them end up in that case sometimes. So, um, you know, these are, are very serious things that uh, I think it's quite necessary to talk to each other about definitely necessary to talk to children about and and as a community that we can do whatever we can do to try to, to combat this. Um, I, I have a big hope that uh, law enforcement will figure out, you know, not the, the street dealer situation, um, but we'll figure out how is it coming into the country? How is it coming into, uh, you know, the flow of this stuff? Going back to the source seems to be more of a... Uh, uh, a better way of uh, cutting that off. So, um, so the uh, the I'll, I'll end by saying that you know we always do um, everything that we can do to try to resuscitate a person um, when they're in this situation. Um, but it's the, the the biggest thing is to try to have the situation not happen. Chief Labor, I want I want to go back to you for a second. Um, you mentioned um, the heroin on Parkview. Um, which is two blocks from my house. <laughs> I live in Cottage Grove. That one hit close to home. Can you talk a little bit about how that was found there, um, if it was a resident tip-off, or how that w that came to be? And then maybe just giving citizens some tools as to what things um, they might observe, when to contact you, um, those types of things. I, I don't believe that the seizure on Parkview had anything to do with tips from okay. neighbors. We, we were aware of it, but the investigation ended up probably starting in the Madison area, and, and this just happened to be where they were dealing and storing their heroin. They had a couple drug houses in Madison, and I would assume that's where most of their deals were taking place. But we're very concerned when we get this type of dealer in Cottage Grove or any small city because with it comes the people that show up to buy it and they are sometimes desperate people that may try to rip off the drug dealer and or the drug dealer may try to rip them off. So oftentimes weapons are involved, violence is involved, thefts are involved, home invasions, and we're very concerned about that. We've had a huge amount of vehicle break-ins in the village, and I would attribute at least some of that to people that are looking for some money to buy heroin are probably getting into these vehicles. Many times people can do something as simple as locking your car when you leave it in your driveway, in your garage, or on the street, because if it's locked, they're not going to bother breaking your windows out. We are seeing quite a few cases of thefts 
with family members, stealing from parents, uncles, aunts. I have two close relatives of myself that did the same thing to their family. So if this is happening to you, obviously I know everybody's concerned about the well-being of their family member, but if it gets to the point where you've tried to help them and you need law enforcement to intervene, we're more than willing to help by uh, prosecuting the case if possible. And if that's your last resort, we're there to try to help. We are also getting Narcan at our police department as are other local departments. And we sometimes are the first responders that get there before the actual uh, emergency services people, the medical people. So a lot of police officers in Dane County are administering Narcan now. So we're hoping that that will also help. If I could add yeah. to that, uh, at the beginning of February, there was a, a weekend, uh, three days, and there were um, 12 incidents in Dane County within three days, which is a big spike. And um, what they found with those uh, individuals is that the particular kind of uh, heroin that they were using was, was also cut with fentanyl, which is another opiate, a synthetic opiate. So it enhanced it, and when we tried to use the Narcan to reverse it, we had to use three times the amount that we normally use to reverse it. So wow. that's another yeah. scary phenomenon, really. Very. One of the other great tools that we do have in Cottage Grove, and I was hoping that they would be here um, this evening, was we do have a canine officer, um, Lars is his name, and um, he can detect narcotics. And he has had some great success, not just in Cottage Grove, but throughout the county. He's assisted um, in the city of Madison and other places. And so that has been a wonderful addition to our police department as well. Um, I'm going to move on to our third speaker here, um, and Sky um, Tikkanen. She's the director of drug poisoning prevention at Safe Communities, and she's a therapist with Connections Counseling. Um, she specializes in working with teens and young adults suffering from opiate dependence. Um, she was the chair um, of a uh, committee working on a 9/11. Skeoda. There yeah. you go, Skeoda. <laughs> um, Good Samaritan legislation. She serves in as, as an advisor for the Parent Addiction Network um, and has contributed her own story of recovery to Waking Up Happy, a handbook of change with memoirs of recovering hope. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if my PowerPoint got up here. Do you it know is it? up. Okay, he'll, wonderful. Yeah, he'll flip for the slides. Fantastic. You, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. So um, in addition to all of those lovely things that Paula was so nice to say about me, um, I am also a person in long-term recovery from heroin addiction. Um, I celebrated 14 years in January. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And so usually I am the end of the night and I am the hope and change portion of your evening um, to let you know that, you know, the community is paying to incarcerate people forever for addiction. Doesn't, it doesn't make sense for your pocketbooks. It doesn't make sense for our society. Um, and allowing people to just struggle with their addiction, it, it's horrible and if you have a loved one that struggles with addiction and you've had to watch that happen I am sorry for you um, so both of those solutions aren't really solutions um, recovery is a solution uh, addiction is a medical disease it was established as a disease decades ago um, and we've been treating it as a disease quite effectively for a long time I do work in a an underfunded system, um, and that's been true, unfortunately, for a long time. It's it's taken time for people to understand that people like me who have struggled with the disease of addiction might have a value and a purpose in your society. Um, I live about five minutes away from you. I pay my taxes. I have two beautiful children. Um, and through the work that I do, I keep your community safer. The people that I'm working with are in recovery. They're not actively using. They're not committing crimes. They're not a drain on your tax base. They're in recovery. They're contributing to your society. Um, and so 
so maybe people like me do have some worth and do have a place here. I do have to just acknowledge quickly that um, that usually the hope and change part comes really easily to me because I'm a very optimistic person. And I know some of the people in the audience tonight. Um, and I know that two of the, the families in the audience tonight have lost their children to this disease of addiction. Um, and so this one is hidden closer to home than the other times that I've presented um, because there is this, this possibility of recovery. There is this light that, that we can get people to and we, we know how to treat addiction. We know what works and we know what doesn't work. Um, and this is also a deadly, chronic, relapsing disease. And unfortunately, not everybody makes it. Um, and so that tonight's a really stark reminder of that for me. So if it's all right, we'll go ahead and get started with the PowerPoint. And um, you guys see the title? All right, fantastic. On to the next one. Um, so we talked a little bit about the about opiates and opioids. Just so that you guys are clear, opiates are the the naturally occurring chemical, and opioids are just the synthetic. So that's all the difference is. You'll hear people use the terms interchangeably. Now you know what the difference is. How do they work? Um, so the way that that opiates and opioids work is that they slow down your central nervous system. So it slows down your breathing, it slows down your heart rate, um, it slows down your your blood pressure, it constricts your blood vessels, um, and then it's used to relieve pain. It's an analgesic. Um, the director, the medical director of the National Safety Council, says that. Um, Opiates and opioids are not the most effective medications for pain relief, but they are the most effective medications for instant anxiety relief. Um, if you continue to take them to treat your anxiety, you will become addicted and they will destroy your life, so don't do that. Um, but a lot of people use opiates and opioids because they do have an underlying anxiety disorder. The signs and symptoms. So if somebody that you love, you're concerned about their use, um, these are some things that you can look for. There are physical signs. Um, Pinprick pupils are the things that, um, that are probably the most characteristic of this. Um, I am known at Connections as being able to tell whether or not somebody has used an opiate or an opioid in the last three days. Um, and so people avoid me like the plague because I can tell by looking in their eyes real quickly when the last time they used was. Um, so, <laughs> You know, you definitely, once you've, once you've figured out what it looks like, you know what it looks like. Um, so track marks, if somebody is using intravenously, that's not the only way to use, right? Some people do, so if they're taking um, a opioid that comes in pill form, some people just take it orally, right? Like the way that you would take a, a pain pill after surgery. Um, some people snort pain pills or the, or heroin or other natural opiates. Um, some people smoke them and some people use them IV. And that's kind of the progression that we see it take. So each, each route of administration, each step gets you higher faster um, and becomes more and more addictive. So you can get a sense of how far somebody is into their addiction by the route of administration that they use. Um, so pallor, that's another thing that I look for right away. So if somebody's complexion just looks like crap, I'm just gonna put that out there, right? So if they don't have color in their face, if they just, if they look, if, if they look sick, right? That's a really good indicator to me that they have been using recently. Um, that did once get me in trouble. I walked out into our waiting room and there was a client and her mother sitting there and both of them looked angry and she had this very unhealthy pallor. And I went up and I was like, oh my God, you relapsed. And she was like, Sky, me and my mom both had the flu and I'm here and I feel like crap. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Awesome, yay, I'm glad you had the flu, all right. Um, 
So if, if somebody has reached the point in their addiction where nothing really matters, right, and that's pretty far down the line, but they'll stop taking care of themselves, right? So their hygiene will go, they look unkempt, they look disheveled. Um, the ways that they used to take care of themselves, they just stop doing that. So if you're looking for those signs, um, those are kind of the physical signs that you can take a look for. There are a lot of behavioral signs as well. So if somebody is lying, um, you know, if, if your teen, if you have a 14-year-old kid and they lie to you, don't think heroin addiction the first time they lie to you, right? But if, it's, if it is like a pattern of lying to you about everything and you can tell that they're just keeping you out of so much of their life, then listen to your instincts. There might be something more wrong there um, than you would at first think. If they are stealing from you, right? If they are stealing your valuable possessions, there's a good chance that they are stealing those in order to be able to fund their use. Um, so, so consider that that might be what's going on. If they are dealing drugs, there is a really good chance that the reason that they are dealing is because they are supporting their habit with, with their dealing. Um, I'm not talking about people that are driving around in Cadillac Escalades and have a Rolex, right? Like, I'm talking about people that have a little stash and buy for friends and then with that extra money are just funding themselves to be able to continue to use. Um, if you find pawn slips, there's a really good chance that they're using. So um, I had a friend that used to work at the pawn store, and I got the inside scoop. Um, and if people are at the pawn store, unless they're buying things back, like I've no, I know that they've relapsed. That's just not behavior that you see um, if people aren't using. Um, so if, they, if there's a big change in their friends, if there's a big change in their mental health, um, look for those big changes, right? See, take a look and just see whether or not things are really changing. All right, what is addiction? Um, addiction is not a moral failing. Um, addiction is not um, that there's something broken inside of you. Addiction is a brain disease. We, we know this, we see this. We can look at PET scans and see very clearly how addiction impacts the brain. Um, there are structural and functional changes to the way that the brain works. Those impact reward systems, motivation, and the memory centers of the brain. When people are in active addiction, they are not logical. Um, one of the law enforcement officers that I really enjoy working with. We were at this community event, um, and at the end, everybody had to say their takeaways. And his takeaway was, I think Sky's been trying to tell me this for a while, but because the addicted brain isn't rational, most rational interventions don't work. And I was like, oh, hallelujah. Yes, this is the point, right? Um, you would think that having to spend 90 days in jail, people would be like, oh, yeah, I'm done, right? I don't want to do that anymore. You'd think that losing, having your family in your life, oh, I'm done with it, right? It costing you everything you own, right? Like, you don't have any possessions left. You haven't showered in a week, right? You, you risk your own death every single day. You've had friends die in front of you. None of those things change addiction, right? Like, all of those things that we as rational people in our rational brains can see and understand, like, oh, that's an awful idea. Don't do that. It doesn't make sense to the addicted brain because the addicted brain is not rational. So that's where I come in, um, because we have to use interventions that deal with that irrational brain. Um, and there's really solid strategies that work for that. But if you try those old ways of like rationally talking to somebody, it's never going to work if they're irrational. OK. 
Um, it is hereditary. So if you have a mother, a father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, grandparent that struggled with the disease of addiction, you are more likely to struggle with the disease of addiction. Um, I have addiction on both sides of my family. That set me up as a prime candidate to be a person that struggled with addiction. Um, it is progressive. So even if you have not used for a while, if you go back to using, you don't get a do-over, right? So at the beginning, before you're in active addiction, using can be fun. Once you reach the point of act active addiction, it is the most miserable experience that you could even comprehend. Um, it is awful, and nobody wants that when they're in their rational brain. So if you relapse and you go back to it, you get maybe a day or two where it's fun. And then it's awful again, right? Like you don't get to start over, it's progressive. So every single time, it's going to get worse. It's chronic. So another problem that we, we've had as a society with addiction is that we've treated it like it's an acute disorder. Um, so if somebody breaks their leg and they go to the emergency room and they get their leg set, then you expect, okay, right? Like they gotta wear the cast for a while, they gotta not walk on it, but then after that, they're fixed. So at Connections, we have a program that lasts 90 days. Um, so for 90 days, we ask people not to use. We support them through that time, and then we celebrate that they've reached 90 days because that's a big deal. But they don't stop, right? So like at 90 days, it's not like, okay, great job. You're never going to struggle with addiction again. What we do is then we, we step services down while still supporting that person, while still gi giving that person what they need to thrive in society. Um, and I've had clients that I've worked with for seven years, right? Sometimes that's what people need. Um, we try uh, what we can to connect people to community resources. And sometimes people are complex and they need therapy and this is a chronic disease and if they need to see me once a month in order to maintain their recovery, that's an investment that's well worth it. All right, um, the, uh, the prevalence of addiction in people that have co-occurring mental health is much, much higher. So I talked a little bit about anxiety disorders. We see an awful lot of anxiety disorders when treating people who are dependent on opiates and opioids. It's one of the big underlying causes. We also see an awful lot of trauma. Um, there's a lot of people who treat their post-traumatic stress disorder with opiates and opioids. And that's just, that's just what it is. So, Addiction is always about relieving pain, right? Sometimes that pain is physical pain. Sometimes that pain is emotional pain. But these people are in pain. Um, they don't deserve to be condemned and thought of as moral failures. They deserve our compassion as a society and some solutions to figure out how they cannot live in pain every day. All right, the progression of the disease. We start with experimentation. A lot of people, some people will never experiment. Lots of people will experiment and will never move on. Some people will use, right? So it's not just once or twice over the lifetime, um, but it's social use. Um, it's within social norms, and then they're done. Some people will abuse the substance, right? So it's starting to have a negative impact on them. It's starting to have some negative impact on their life. Often, once it's had a negative impact, they say, hmm, no thank you, I'm done. And they stop using. Some people then will go on to dependence on the substance. Um, and that's where that active addiction comes in. That's where that irrational mind comes in. Because once you've crossed that line into dependence, there's no coming back from that. All right, so this shows some of the PET scans, um, so you can clearly see how the brain changes. So this is looking at dopamine receptors um, decreased by addiction. Dopamine makes you feel good. So people who are struggling with addiction, they don't feel good. Um, 
what we know about opiate addiction is that for two years after a person's last use of opiates, their brain has not healed. So their brain will experience pain at a higher level than yours will. So things that are painful will, will hurt them more than they will hurt you. They will feel sad most of the time. Um, they don't, the, the natural opiates um, that Dwayne was talking about, uh, don't bond to the receptor sites the way that they're supposed to anymore. So when you walk outside and it is February and it's 57 degrees, um, if you have been recently addicted to opiates, you're not going to feel happy that, oh, we were like getting a taste of spring before we're supposed to. Um, you don't get those, those natural endorphins, and so you don't get that natural happiness. Um, and it takes two full years for the brain to heal and go back to the way that it was pre-addiction. Um, that's a long time to ask people to be sad. That's a long time to ask people to hurt. Uh, if we don't take that into account when we're treating this disease, if we don't take that into account as communities, we really risk, risk sending people back towards their addiction because the drug do, does make them happy. It doesn't last, right? It's destroying everything around them. The drug does make it so they're not in pain. It doesn't last. It's destroying everything around them. But sometimes when you're in pain and you're so sad and you feel like you can't take it one more day, that's the best answer that you have, um, unless we give people a better answer. Okay, another way to look at it. Um, does anybody, has anybody ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Awesome. You're gonna tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So he says that it is like the food pyramid, but it, instead it's the life pyramid. It's the, the needs of life. And we'll go ahead and take a look at it now. So what Maslow's hierarchy of needs says is that if you can't breathe, you don't actually care whether or not your boyfriend really loves you the most. Um, if you are starving to death, you, you're not really thinking about whether or not you're going to get into a good college, right? So it's just that we have to take care of our basic needs before we can move on to those higher order needs. Um, what the research tells us, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs came out in 1840, so it's been around for a long time, it's been studied for a long time, is that those two bottom needs, the physiological and the safety, stay the same for everybody. The ones at the top go in whatever order your personality sees fit to put them in. So it's different for different people, but the, the physiological and the safety needs are absolutely the same for everybody. What we also know is that um, there's been multiple studies where mice have been given the choice between cocaine and food. Um, prior to them choosing the cocaine often, they would choose both. Once they become actively addicted to the cocaine, they choose the cocaine every single time as they starve themselves to death, right? They don't choose to eat, they just choose to continue using cocaine. So what we know is that, that in the addicted brain's hierarchy of needs, that substance or that compulsion is even more important than food. When I was in active addiction, my brain was telling me that I needed that substance in order to survive. I want you to think about this because, because people in active addiction do horrible things. Right? Nobody, I will never tell you otherwise. People in active addiction do horrible things. If you look at it as if they are desperate and they are trying to survive, then maybe you see them the way that they actually are 
instead of defining them by those actions. Because they're not, they're not horrible people. They're, they're wonderful people. Once you get to know them, once they're not in active addiction, you know, my clients are the most wonderful people. And I get to see this soft, amazing side of them. I get to see when they stop using and they decide that they are going to follow their dreams and go to college and get married and have babies. Um, I see when they go from their families barely being able to, to stand what to do next. Like they can't, it's so hard on families, this disease of addiction, right? To when somebody is in long-term recovery and their family comes back together um, and it's just, it's some of the most beautiful things that you've ever seen in your whole life, right? So just, just something to think about that maybe it's not that they do horrible things because they're horrible people. Maybe it's that they do horrible things because they're desperate and their brain is telling them that they need this substance in order to survive. This fits with that. So um, I want you all to know what you as people can do when you leave here tonight. And the biggest thing that you can do is understand the difference between guilt and shame um, and apply that concept to people that are struggling with addiction. So guilt, I love, right? When somebody has a relapse and they come in and they say, Sky, I feel so guilty. I feel awful about myself. I can't believe that I did this. I'm like, awesome, right? I love that your relapse sucked, right? Like that is good news for me. Um, when somebody comes in and says, Sky, I relapsed because I always relapse, because I'm never going to be anything more than an addict, that's when it switches over into shame, right? That's not about, I made a mistake and I feel guilty about that mistake. That's, I am a mistake and there's no hope for me. There's nothing better that I can ever expect in my life because I am that mistake. So, in our language, when we're talking about people that struggle with addiction, you'll notice that I say that a lot, right? Um, I don't say, I'm an addict. I say, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I don't say, you know, I work with addicts. I say, I work with people struggling with the disease of addiction, right? And it's a lot more words, but it matters because I'm not shaming them, right? Like, I see them as people. I see that they're so much more than this disease. And people need to be reminded of that. Because if you came here tonight with that mindset that, you know, these addicts need to get out of our community, you know, these junkies are bringing crime and violence into our community, right? And I'm not saying that any of you did. But if you came here tonight with that mindset, you're helping to reinforce that shame. Um, if you came, if you leave with the mindset that people are struggling, people are struggling with this horrible disease of addiction, and heroin is a really highly addictive drug. And if I can, if I can help to support somebody, you know, it's not these people that are coming into your community. It's these people that are part of your community, right? You know, these are mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, sisters, brothers. Um, these are people that matter in your community, and each of you can help just by the language that you use, right? If you actually take the time to reach out to somebody that may be struggling and say, you know, I'm so sorry that you're going through this, don't ever give them money, right? Like, let me be clear on that. <laughs> don't give them money. Um, don't put yourself in danger. But letting them know that you see them as a person, that can be an incredibly powerful thing for somebody that isn't sure whether or not they are anymore, that started to lose seeing themselves as a person. All right, so we talked a little bit about this already. Um, let people that you 
let people know if you're concerned about them, right? So don't be afraid to, stay, to say it. If you're seeing signs, let people know. You don't have to, to pretend like you're not seeing it in order to like be PC, right? If you're seeing it, say something. Um, but do it from a place of compassion instead of a place of judgment. Um, let them know that there are resources to help. Addiction treatment works, right? Um, it's a chronic disease, so it will work and people will have relapses. So if somebody gets two, three years of sobriety during their work with me, I feel like that's a really good thing. If they have a relapse two or three years later, they had a relapse. I hope they come back and see me. We'll work through it. We'll figure out what went wrong and we'll get them back on the right track because this is a chronic disease and we have to treat it like it's a chronic disease. That doesn't mean that treatment doesn't work. That just means that we're treating a chronic disease. So I, I want people to be real clear on that. Um, effective treatment doesn't mean no relapses ever, right? If that's what effective treatment meant for chronic diseases, my father-in-law has diabetes and he would be the worst treatment failure ever, right? Because sometimes he forgets his insulin, and sometimes he forgets to check his blood sugar, and sometimes he has like three pieces of birthday cake for my son's birthday, right? Like sometimes things happen. Um, that, that doesn't mean that it's a failure, right? It just means that he needs to talk to his doc, go back to the drawing board, figure it out. All right, um, if they are not ready to get help, Support them emotionally. Do not support them financially, just repeat. Um, allow for natural consequences. So if they're doing something that's going to, to bring consequences into their life, don't intervene to try to save them. Um, natural consequences are important. It's important for people to feel the consequences of their action. Um, but don't, you don't have to do it in a judgmental way come from a place of compassion and kindness, but just allow the consequences. Um, get your own support. There's a lot of different places for people that, are, that have loved ones that are going through this struggle. So there's Families Anonymous, there's Al-Anon, there's Alateen. There's so many different resources in our community. So if you are one of those people and you need uh, to like get pointed in the right direction, come feel free to stop by and talk to me afterwards. Um, I'll make sure that you get where you need to go. Um, if they are ready to get help, help connect them to resources. You guys have this amazing resource in your community called the Parent Addiction Network. Um, the Parent Addiction Network is a group of parents who were not happy with the treatment um, and the availability of resources that their children were getting. And so they put a lot of time and energy into putting together this huge list of all of the treatment resources, of all of the sober living facilities. They give you a blow by blow of what to expect if, you're, if your kid has to go to jail, right? Like their, their website is just, it's a wealth of knowledge. Use it because a lot of parents put a lot of time and energy into that. Um, and, then, and then offer your emotional support, right? So no matter what, this is a person, this is a person you love. Don't withhold your emotional support. Do withhold your financial support if people are still using. Okay. So there is the Parent Addiction Network that I just talked about. I should have gone to that slide then. Um, and I think, I think that might be everything. Yep, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sky, and all of our panelists. Um, that came this evening. A couple of wrap-up things before we go to questions. Um, if you did not receive a, uh, an orange paper, um, put your hand up and a coalition member will deliver one to you. It's just a quick survey we'd like you to take um, and uh, just give us your opinions. If there are other topics um, that you would like to see addressed, feel free to just flip it over and write it on the back. Um, we are going to give away a gift card. Um, we're going to pull from this, so put your email down. However, you will not get spam from us, I promise. If you want to get involved, where it says, do you want to get involved? Yes. Do you want to be notified of future events? Yes. Then you'll get an email. Otherwise, we won't bug you, unless you want the gift card. Um, 
One quick thing. Um, again, we talked about the Monona Cares and Cottage Grove Cares coalitions, and I'd actually like our coalition members to stand up that are in the audience tonight, please. please. Don't be shy. Stand up. Thank you. Diane. Okay. So we've got a good group of people here. Um, Dan Olson, um, our superintendent of schools. Um, Principal Paul Brost um, from Monona Grove High School. Um, Diane Wiedenbeck, former village president in Cottage Grove. Sean, Officer Sean. Um, Vogel, I'm, uh, I'm, thank you. Thank you, Fogeltons. I knew I was going to get that wrong, even though I see you all the time. Um, who is our uh, school? Um, officer liaison for both Glacial Drumlin and Cottage Grove as well as the high school. Kathy Kalina standing at the back with surveys in her hand if you need one. Um, Kathy is with Family Resources of Madison and she's really kind of the linchpin that keeps us all together. So thank you to you all. You can be seated. Um, we have a couple of other people who are not here but as you can see this is a small group of folks um, trying to cover two big communities, and we need help. I'll be honest with you, we need help. We really need parents. Um, I think I'm the only parent that is involved in two communities. And with all the kids that we have in Cottage Grove and Monona, we certainly have more parents. Um, so please consider getting involved with us. We do have a meeting coming up. It's actually right here at New Life Church. It's going to be on Tuesday, March 15th at 5.30. Um, that'll be our next gathering meeting. It'll actually be out in our community room, which is right out these doors. You're welcome to stop by. You can sign up and indicate your interest on here as well. Um, or there was also a sign up out there. One other quick note, um, on April 30th, we are going to be hosting these two coalitions, a prescription drug take back day. Um, this, we talked a little bit about um, with law enforcement and such, um, the different um, things that we might all have in our household that can be a gateway to heroin. And so we are going to be in Cottage Grove at the hometown pharmacy on that day. They will be collecting your unused prescriptions. And in Monona, the medicine shop will be doing that as well. And we'll have more details as to times and such. Um, but these great businesses are partnering with us to get those things out of your home, off the streets, um, into a safe place. Well, these are great questions, and um, in the interest of time, and because uh, we want to get you out before the snow, I'm going to kind of wrap up this portion, but our panelists will be around so to ask individual questions of, as well as coalition members that were here um, as well. Two quick things. Please remember to hand your survey um, to Kathy on the way out. Also, on a table back by our sound booth, we actually have a book um, called How to Raise a Drug-Free Kid. And um, they're on sale for $9, payable to Family Service of Madison. Um, great resources. There's a whole table out there full of resources, facts, figures, how to talk to your kids, um, all sorts of different things. So um, please take advantage of those. Please spread the word. Please get involved. And this is an amazing first step with all of you here tonight. So I want to thank all of you and our panelists for this evening. Have a great evening. <laughs>